There is broad agreement in psychology that the unconscious exists and that it is responsible for many, if not most, of our beliefs and actions. More controversial is the highly motivated, irrational and basic biology-driven subconscious proposed by Freud. Research into the mind has three means of investigation. There are surveys, laboratory experiments and case studies. By case studies, we mean detailed psychological examinations of people, largely those who are undergoing psychotherapy. They involve numerous sessions spread over months or years, as well as a great trust between the therapist and patient and intimate inquiry. The strength of the method is that it can achieve a level of complexity and depth of understanding about the minds of individual people that other methods cannot. The weakness is that they contain a substantial subjective component in the interpretation of results, which are therefore poorly repeatable by other investigators. This weakness has made the method fall out of favour as the fashion in both medicine and science has moved towards repeatability of findings. Freud exclusively used case studies as his evidence and based his theory on powerful but deeply hidden biological forces connected with nutrition, voiding, aggression and sex. In the field of psychoanalysis, where case studies still form the principal evidence base, Freud's theories have proved durable. But this is not the case in psychology. There are two main reasons for this. First, there are difficult issues to access via psychometric or laboratory experiments. And second, with psychoanalytic and psychodynamic approaches out of fashion, there is little interest among psychologists in testing its predictions. Research that has been done focuses more on reactions to everyday social goals and often mundane laboratory tasks. The current dominant view of psychology of the cognitive unconscious differs in a number of respects from that of Freud. In this view, the unconscious does not have motivations that are hidden or independent of those of the conscious mind, and there is no specific significance associated with the biological motivations described by Freud. Mental processes are unconscious because they do not receive the prominence necessary for them to cross the threshold into consciousness, or because they have become automatic by regular practice as shown by activities like playing the piano, typing on a keyboard, or tying shoelaces. According to this theory, unconscious content is not primarily motivational, but may provide implicit motives that we are not aware of, as opposed to explicit motives that we are aware of. Implicit learning and implicit memory refer to the knowledge acquired by people and their ability to recall it without being consciously aware or able to verbalise it. Implicit learning is the non-intentional and incidental acquisition of knowledge and implicit memory is the non-intentional recourse to this knowledge. Unconscious knowledge is the information itself. Examples are the grammatical rules used when someone speaks in their mother tongue. This is particularly striking in children aged between four and six before they have any notions of grammar. When asked how it is that they speak correctly, they're unable to say anything other than it seems right. There do appear to be differences between conscious and unconscious knowledge. There are two areas where conscious and unconscious processing takes place in anatomically distinct locations. The first and most studied of these areas is vision. There's extensive data on the difference between the conscious ventral visual stream to the visual cortex and the unconscious dorsal visual stream to the posterior parietal cortex. We'll not expand on this here because its relevance to human factors is limited. The second area is memory. Korsakoff syndrome, head injury and strokes affect the anatomical structures in the brain, known as fornices, mammillary bodies and medial temporal lobes. These conditions impair specific memory, but experiments on affected people find that implicit memory is substantially intact. A particularly dramatic example of this was an experiment carried out by Swiss neurologist Klaprad, published in 1911. He took a profoundly amnesic patient and shook hands with her. In his own hand, he had concealed a pin with which he pricked her. Following this, the patient could not remember having their hand pricked, but refused to shake hands with Claprad again, claiming it was well known that people often hid pins in their hands. Experimental evidence in normal people suggests that knowledge acquired and stored unconsciously is retained more reliably in implicit memory than knowledge that is gained explicitly. Although it is possible to communicate with the unconscious mind using text and language, unconscious knowledge tends not to be linguistic in nature. Rather, it is procedural. It also tends to be holistic, 
such as that the compositional structures, such as the sequence of letters P, Q, are not deconstructed into constituents such as P and Q, but are remembered with no internal structure. Subconscious knowledge requires stereotypical pattern recognition for its exercise. Unlike conscious knowledge, it cannot be applied via analysis to unfamiliar situations. Performance in implicit learning is said to be independent of the performance of explicit memory. Implicit learning is consistent in any one person, so that people who perform well on one experiment also tend to perform well on others. The correlation between a person's performance in implicit learning and their performance on explicit learning is relatively weak, and there is little or no correlation with learning or memory. This hypothesis is less well established through the evidence, but it seems that implicit learning is independent of both age and IQ and shows lower variance in populations than shown by explicit learning. Why should there be an unconscious kind of knowledge? One reason is that we only have one conscious channel of processing, but we can process many things without consciously doing so. For example, we can think of disparate subjects while competently driving a car. It may be that the evolution of consciousness occurred at a relatively late stage in human development, and therefore unconscious processes are older in evolutionary terms. In addition, humans appear to start learning at the latest immediately after birth, when mental life is thought to be, for the most part, unconscious. So, how important is unconscious cognition? Psychodynamic theory holds that it's by far the most important of our mental processes. In contrast, behavioural psychology denied or marginalised its importance, particularly during the days when radical behaviourism was in fashion. But this has again changed, and it's now thought to be of great importance in determining performance and decision-making, if not as devious as the psychodynamic unconscious of Freud. Two theories predominate in contemporary psychology addressing the question of unconscious decision-making. Both have been subject to criticism. These are the somatic marker hypothesis and the unconscious thought theory. This suggests that unconscious cognitive processing leads to somatic changes, such as gut feelings, racing heart or sweating, which influence decision making. Learning starts with an association between a perceived situation and an emotion. The relevance of the physical bodily response is that experimenters can measure it. For example, you might be in a cold, dark room with blue light coming in through the window when something jumps out at you. This invokes fear and a flight-or-fight response. When you're next in a cold, dark room with a blue light, the fight-or-flight response may be invoked again and the somatic changes that occur invoke fear. This hypothesis has been criticised on the grounds of inefficiency, with a suggestion that such an indirect route is unlikely to have evolved and that reinforcement would be sufficient to account for such learning. This theory actually concerns conscious decision-making with information that is consciously accessible. The theory is that with highly complex situations and involved decisions, the quality of any decision is improved if the cognitive processing is subconscious. This kind of decision is taken by addressing an issue consciously, then sleeping on it or turning attention elsewhere for a few days or weeks before returning to the question. If the solution does not pop into your head first, usually at times of relaxation, hence the three B's of creative innovation, the bus, the bath and the bed. The reverse is true of simple analytic decisions that are better taken directly in consciousness. Recent research has replicated findings that suggest that better decisions are made after distraction than deliberation, but has questioned the general superiority of such decision making and suggested additional complexity with decisions often being made quickly using conscious thought and being accessed more easily after distraction.